you've been searching for the best way to generate passive income in your life and heard that real estate is a great way to do it, but you're tired of all the so-called gurus who are all talk and no substance. Get ready to celebrate because Kevin Bupp has spent 14 years successfully making it happen. This is the Real Estate Investing for Cashflow podcast. Now, here's Kevin Bupp. Hey guys, Kevin Bupp here, and I want to welcome you to another episode of the Real Estate Investing for Cashflow podcast, where our mission is to help you build and maintain massive amounts of cash flow through income producing real estate investments. Now, our guest for this week's show is real estate and retail shopping center expert, David Pucci. Now, David is a founder and active partner at Baseline Investments and is responsible for long-term strategic direction of the company regarding capital development and fund formation. He oversees and approves major investment decisions, including serving as a voting member of the investment committee. Additionally, David has been responsible for raising approximately $300 million for Baseline-sponsored funds. Now, David graduated with honors from the University of Denver with both a Bachelor of Arts and Law degrees. He practiced law for five years in Denver. Colorado and specialized in corporate mergers and acquisitions in real estate law prior to moving into the real estate investment sector. Now, here's what you're going to learn in our interview with David today. You're going to learn how David and his team fared during the 2008 recession and how this challenging time somewhat recentered their business from industrial office and neighborhood retail to solely putting 100% of their focus on the neighborhood retail sector. You're going to learn why David feels that there is an equal amount of stability, if not sometimes even more stability, in local mom and pop tenants as opposed to national credit tenants. And so David's going to actually share his perspective on why he feels this way, and he actually has factual data to back it up. you learn about the various value-add strategies that David and his team implement when acquiring a new center. you learn why he chooses to focus on Midwest secondary and tertiary markets and tends to steer clear of coastal towns. you learn how he feels about the potential threat of e-commerce and autonomous vehicles, and how he and his team mitigate the risk associated with these changing technologies. We're also going to discuss the debt and equity strategy that David and his team utilize on all new acquisitions, and much, much more. And so guys, with that, I'm super excited to get onto the show with David, but before we do, just have a few quick housekeeping items to run through. First and foremost, like I do every week, I like to go through my one personal best and one professional best from the prior week. So I'll start off by giving you my personal best. So my oldest son, Jackson, he's five years old. He actually started kindergarten this past week, and uh, we actually did a meet and greet, and uh, he went to his first day of school, actually the first week of school, and it's been awesome. He's got an awesome teacher. She's super nice, seems very engaged with the kids, and he's been having a great time. He was a little nervous his first day, but it was pretty awesome. We live in a golf cart community, and so the elementary school is literally right around the corner from our house, and so we were able to roll up to the first day of school in the golf cart and drop him off, which he thought was super, super cool, and so just really excited for him on this next leg of his journey in life. Additionally, I mentioned a few weeks ago that we signed Jackson up for an after-school taekwondo program, and so he's just got a lot of exciting things going on and, and happening in his life, and I, we couldn't be more proud of him, so just uh, it's been an awesome week here. As far as the professional best, now, I get a lot of, you know, we get reviews on the show. I get a lot of, you know, even gifts and letters that get sent to me and, and, and have been over the last, you know, five or six years I've been doing this podcast. Just people thanking me and, and things of that nature for the show and the content, you know, tell me how I might have had an impact on their life. Well, I actually received a handwritten letter this this past week from a listener whose name I'm going to keep private. And in this letter, she thanked me for the incredible impact that I've had on her personally and professional life. And most of which has come as a result of this very podcast, the one that you're listening to now. I mean, again, don't get me wrong. We've received many other letters over the years and in each and every one of them, I love reading. It's just, it's a beautiful thing when, when folks take the time to share how the show has impacted their life in a very positive way. But for some reason, this letter had a much more profound impact on me. I'm, I'm not sure why. The story was very, very personal and, uh, and she went very in depth. And so just to simply put it, I'm very humbled in knowing that the message that me and my guests share on the show is, is, is truly having a positive impact on so many people. And I'm just grateful for having the ability to touch so many lives, right? I mean, I, I do this show, but if you weren't here listening, then it wouldn't be really worthy of anything. And so I'm grateful for you, for the listener, for taking the time to listen in each and every week. And all I ask is that I have the ability to continue adding value to your lives. And so I, I very much enjoy that. So with that being said, guys, if you do enjoy what we're doing here, if, if you feel like we're adding value to your life, uh, your, your, your personal life, your professional 
personal life, all the above, and you haven't done so already, take a minute to leave a review on iTunes, okay? As you know, I mention it each and every week. It's it's really the lifeblood. It, it's the lifeblood of the show. helps us attract awesome guests, and it also helps us reach more people. And like I do every week, I like to give a shout out to someone that's taking the time to, uh, to leave that review. And this one is from the screen name, Callie Anthony. So Callie Anthony says, I've listened to Kevin's podcast for at least five years. There were no commercially focused podcasts available 10 to 12 years ago. And so when I stumbled across his site, it was like mana from heaven. I have not been disappointed. The quality of his guests, the diversity of his guests, the deep expertise of his guests is amazing. The content of his show has already raised my real estate IQ. Kevin is also very approachable, provided you're not wasting his time. I've sent along several deals to his office that he has not been attracted to. However, he always takes the time to look at a potential deal, and if he doesn't like it, we'll explain why. I hope to continue to avail myself of this quality of material provided by a man who actually cares about what he's teaching you. So, uh, Kelly Anthony, I really appreciate you taking the time to leave that in, and hopefully one day we can do a deal together. So, it sounds like we've been communicating quite a bit over these years, and uh, hopefully one of these days come up here, we'll have the opportunity of doing a deal together. Uh, lastly, guys, before we get on to the show with David, just want to remind you of the free 30-minute phone call that I offer each and every Friday. Friday, where we can discuss anything and everything your heart desires about real estate investing, whether you're just getting started or whether you're, whether you're a seasoned professional, I'd love to connect with you. In order to schedule this call with me, go to my website, kevinbupp.com. And on the right-hand side, there's a button that says schedule a call with Kevin. It'll take you to my calendar link, pick a time, be sure to put some specific notes in there about what it is you'd like to chat about, specific questions you might have. That way, our 30 minutes can be best spent together. And now, guys, without further ado, let's get on to the part of the show that you've been waiting on, which is our interview with David. David Pucci. So here we go. All righty, guys, it is my honor to introduce my guest for today's show, founder and partner of Baseline Investments, David Pucci. David, how are you doing today? Very good, Kevin. Thanks. Yeah, thanks for joining us here. Very much looking forward to having a conversation with you about your business, about Baseline Investments. You guys are you know, heavily invested in the uh, the retail sector. And so very much looking forward to kind of diving deep into your business, the structure, you know, how, how that company came about. But before we do that, David, if we could maybe take a few minutes for those folks that aren't familiar with you, don't know you or your story, take a sure. few minutes to tell us a little bit more about yourself. Sure, absolutely. I grew up in the Chicago area and moved to Denver, Colorado for college and have been here in Denver ever since. Our company is based here and all of our operations are here in Denver. So um, we uh, live here in Colorado and obviously enjoy living in Colorado. It's a beautiful place to live. So I uh, went to college here, actually went to law school, practiced law for a little bit, and then uh, got into the real estate investment business in 1998. So I've been uh, working in uh, real estate, commercial real estate uh, since that time for for 20 years now and have uh, been part of a few different companies over that 20 year time. But uh, Baseline Investments is the primary company that I helped found and that I've been a part of. Uh, we actually started in 2003. So been in the real estate business for 20 years, uh, been in the business of uh, actually owning and operating neighborhood shopping centers during that whole time, which is what we do today. So I've had a good run through, you know, a lot of good times and some challenging times also, as you can yeah. imagine, in the, in the 20 years. But um, basically, uh, that's my, uh, okay. my professional story. Thanks. Okay. Okay. Fantastic. And you know, just so we have a better understanding, what was the actual catalyst to, to you know, to start Baseline Investments? I mean, how, how does Baseline yeah. differ from, what, you know, the different activities you were participating sure. in the retail sector prior to forming the company? Well, if we go back to my background as an attorney, um, I uh, gravitated from practicing law into property management, actually, a commercial property management. I uh, worked for a uh, local developer and, and managed all of his properties for a good period of time. And then I uh, always had an entrepreneurial desire and uh, had the opportunity to start a predecessor company, which was a third-party property management company. And our company today really carries on a lot of the traditions that um, I started with when I broke free from practicing law. And, and primarily, that we're never been a transactional type of company. We've always been more of an operating company. And uh, we've always been a company that 
not only operates the real estate in a uh, true long-term fashion, but since we have uh, raised money throughout our history, Mm -hmm. the capital that we raise, we have always treated that really from a uh, more of a fiduciary type of capacity and not transactional. So Mm -hmm. we raise money, we uh, treat our investors carefully. We're, um, we, you know, view our business as being a steward of their Mm -hmm. capital. So I guess when you combine the operating history with the idea that we, um, we take seriously an investment from one of our clients, you get this, I guess, different view of the world maybe than, than, than a brokerage firm, for instance, which you know really is a transactional-based firm. Mm-hmm. Uh, our firm has always been very much an operating, uh, I guess it's kind of a fiduciary type of attitude with the capital that we're uh, entrusted with. So combine those things, we've uh, operated, I think, a little bit differently than some, than some other firms, you know, over the past 20 years. Mm-hmm. Okay, fantastic. So speaking to, um, you know, to the retail shopping sector, give us a, a little bit of a better idea of, of what that exactly means to baseline. I mean, what is the, the, the target asset type you guys yeah. are going for? Are we talking single tenant? Are we talking anchored shopping center or all the above? Yeah, uh, well, since 1998, we have been in the business of owning and operating multi-tenant neighborhood shopping centers. And uh, as you know, uh, there are different sectors of commercial real estate. Uh, You mentioned there's, uh, well, and different sectors within the retail side of commercial real estate. So there's malls, single tenant, uh, anchored neighborhood shopping centers, unanchored neighborhood shopping centers. Uh, very, there's a variety of different types of, uh, of shopping centers in the space. Uh, our niche in the world is owning and operating multi-tenant neighborhood shopping centers that are primarily unanchored. Um, our investment thesis, Kevin, is that we like to own shopping centers that have many small tenants as opposed to having shopping centers that have uh, maybe a big box as an anchor, grocery store, some other type of an anchor, or for that matter, a power center where you have multiple big boxes lined up in a row. And we've really honed in on that investment niche over the past 20 years, seeing what's happening in good times and in bad. And what we've seen is that throughout an up cycle or a down cycle, people go to their neighborhood shopping centers. They visit their everyday goods and service type of businesses consistently, again, in good times and in bad. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, we have, as you can imagine, uh, a lot of barbershops, hair salons, health clubs, neighborhood restaurants, dry cleaners. Those are the things that people do every day. So mm-hmm. our tenant base is very much an everyday goods and service type of tenant base. And how does that relate to then, you know, I guess the credit grade of the tenant that you're working with on a typical basis? You know, you know, you hear a lot of folks in the retail sector speaking to A-grade tenants. I mean, they want the the subways of the world. They want the... Right. You know, Publix as a, as a grocery store. I can't think of all the old Kinkos, what have you. The list goes on and on. So I'm, I'm guessing that you're dealing with a slightly, you know, m- well, more of a mom and pop type business. And the credit ratings would vary, you know, in comparison yeah. to that of a national type tenant, correct? Yeah. And I mean, our tenant base um, is, it's really a combination of, of uh, three types of credit, national credit tenants. So for instance, uh, you know, the dollar stores now are very good credit. We, we have our subways, we have our, um, we have our Jimmy John's, we have our great clips. We have all types of, uh, tenants who would be considered uh, good or national credit that we also have regional credit. So that would mean an operator that has, let's say four or five different businesses and, mm-hmm their credit would be more robust because of the multiple stores that they have and their locations. And then we have the mom and pop tenant who is the single barber shop, the single 
nail salon, the single dry cleaner. So our tenant base is actually equally distributed over the three types of credit that you would see in shopping centers. And then the other part of that question, though, which we've found in our experience over 20 years is that, you know, the small mom and pop tenants may not be considered credit from a Wall Street perspective, but from a reality perspective, they are actually really good credit because these are family businesses that people fight for every day. And Mm -hmm. again, you know, whether it's the height of the economic cycle like we might be in right now or the depths of the Great Recession in 2009, uh, it, it's difficult for that mom and pop tenant, that mom and pop business to close down because it's going to basically wipe out their family. So yeah. we see them to be very resilient. And you know, as we're out uh, talking to capital partners, sometimes that's a little bit of a battle to describe that. <laughs> <laughs> sure. Now, if I'm on Wall Street talking to the uh, the big boys on Wall Street, uh, they really can't get their arms around that barbershop. But you know, we can through not only our experience but uh, research show that those tenants actually, in reality, are are pretty good credit. Yeah, that makes sense. I mean, that's a very unique perspective and I would have never thought it from that angle, but it makes a ton of sense. I mean, they probably have put their entire life savings, yeah. everything they have is in that business. And so right. if they don't have that business, they literally probably don't have a roof over their head any longer, right? Because it literally, it supports everything that they do. It supports their lifestyle, it supports yeah. their children. That makes sense. I mean, they're willing to go to battle for it. And yeah. whereas in a, you know, the complete opposite scenario, when you've got a, a larger national chain, um, one location is not doing so great. You know, it's it's right. a little bit easier sometimes just to you know cut the fat, right, <laughs> and, and focus oh, yeah. on more and, productive yeah. Uh, locations. Yeah, absolutely, Kevin. And uh, we we like to say around here that you know when a national big box decides to close their stores, that's a boardroom decision. When the local barber decides to close up uh, his or her business, that's a kitchen table decision. Mm-hmm. And the kitchen table decisions have more meaning a lot of times than the boardroom decision is because it's, you know, it's fairly easy when you have 7,000 stores to say, well, we're going to cut 700. And, you know, that all, that's all done in the boardroom and in the office of the, uh, of the chief financial officer. So the decision that's made around the kitchen table uh, sometimes can have much more gravity for that particular tenant. Yeah, no, that makes a ton of sense. So, you know, speaking to the different markets that you you guys are invested in, what's the actual region of the U.S. that you spend most of your time? We spend most of our time in the middle of the country. Okay. Um, And, uh, you know, I I know you're in Florida and Florida is a great place to do business, but... uh, Florida is also pretty expensive as far as real estate is concerned. So um, I understand that quite well. <laughs> Most of our investments are outside the state of Florida. So right. I get it. <laughs> right, right, right. Yeah. So, you know, we like to say anything about the coasts when we're talking about the cities that we're in. And, and you know, just to put some uh, reality to it, we're in places like uh, Dallas, we're in uh we're in Kansas City and Omaha, the Chicago area, Indianapolis. We're in Nashville, Louisville, Kentucky, Columbus, Ohio. You know, they're middle of the country cities that are stable and for the most part growing. And clearly within the submarket that we're in, a particular shopping center, that's a growing submarket. So mm-hmm. the reason why we like to be in the middle of the country is that we find great stability in the, the cities that we're in. We also find that there's just less competition in uh, acquiring a shopping center in the middle of the country as opposed to on the coast. And because there's less competition, um, prices are typically better in the middle of the country. So I mean, right off the bat, if uh, we're looking at a neighborhood shopping center, in Indianapolis, uh, with similar demographics, the neighborhood around it, similar tenant base, similar traffic than that same shopping center in LA. All right. Our cap rate is going to be higher. Our price is going to be lower than that shopping center in LA, or for that matter, in uh, in most places in Florida. So, uh, or Denver. You guys have gotten or, quite expensive. Well, yeah, and Kevin, you know, <laughs> this is. 
indicative of that, but we don't own anything in the state of Colorado. Yeah. We're based here. Because <laughs> Denver is uh, now, you know, it's coastal pricing basically. So, you know, we can go to Madison, Wisconsin, another great college town and buy a shopping center there. That's a high quality shopping center and, and buy that at a, at a pretty good discount to what it would be um, on the coast. What does the, uh, the typical profile of your sellers look like? Are most of these um, local owners, smaller owners of these uh, centers or are yeah. there some larger national operators that, that operate like you guys do in this footprint of the smaller, I guess, multi-tenanted you know, neighborhood right. centers? Yeah. The, I mean, the, the, the demographic of our seller is uh, typically an individual mm-hmm. and it's typically an aging individual. So it's a woman or a man who was on that shopping center for 20 years or longer, cash flowed it great, ran it to the best of their ability, but something is changing in their life. Um, they're getting older, so they're maybe retiring or there are other things going on. And you know, the, the funny thing about it is that that shopping center is typically provided a great income for the family or whatever, but the kids probably don't want to run the shopping center. They really have the money. So we are able to buy that shopping center from the aging individual. And um, it's kind of a win-win all around. Uh, Mm -hmm. And then when we do that, Kevin, we, because of our size, our scope, we institute best practices and institutional management styles. So, you know, basically we're taking this mom and pop owned shopping center that's been doing just fine for that particular seller and then instituting best practices to add value. And uh, there are a lot of examples about how we do that. Uh, being but, but that we're on that topic, let's let's yeah. share some of those. I mean, because I think that's yeah. that's a, a big part of our listener base. I mean, whether they're in the the retail, the office, the multifamily sector, you know, all the above, you know, value add is such a big word nowadays, right? I mean, it's yeah. uh, whether you're buying something that doesn't have much or has a, you know, it's a huge turnaround opportunity. Value add is still top of mind and uh, you want to be able to go in and, and make improvements and, and realize those improvements from a capital perspective. So how does that work in your space? Yeah. So in our space, uh, we're, when we're buying a shopping center, it's already cash flowing, first of all. So mm-hmm. we have, um, let's say it's 75 or 80% occupied. And it's probably a 10 space shopping center. So there's maybe one or two vacancies in it. And the the prior owner, again, has done their best to run the shopping center, keep it occupied. They've done a good job. But, you know, they haven't necessarily pushed rents to where the market is because they may not know what the market is in their particular city. They may not have taken a look at the tenant base and said, okay, well, you know, we have uh, Joe's Barbershop, which is great. Joe's been doing pretty good, but is that the best use for that space? Well, no, maybe a Great Clips is, and maybe Great Clips is going to pay $15 a square foot and Joe's paying nine. So we'll take a look at each particular space in a property and figure out how to best utilize that space all keeping in mind that we're in the community and, you know, we don't want to do things that are going to disrupt that neighborhood shopping center, but, you know, looking at the rent roll, looking at each tenant, uh, figuring out how to best utilize that space is, is very important, you know, and then, and then we do things like looking at the shopping center and saying, okay, well, we have a pet site here that we can develop or we have a, uh, some element in the parking lot that we can change. So, you know, we'll take a look at the physical characters, characteristics of the property. Also, since we have scale um, and are well capitalized, we can improve the property physically, uh, facelift, parking lot, lighting, numerous things that we can do. So when you look at both the tenant base and the, the, the financial part of the tenant base, the physical improvements, there's a real mix of things that we can do to add value to that property. And it's not only filling the vacancy, but it's, it's also getting the most um, rent per square foot that we can from a particular space. And again, keeping in mind that this is a community or neighborhood shopping center and we don't want to, we don't want to make the neighborhood mad by, you know, (laughs) just willy nilly kicking out some tenant and putting somebody new in. Um, There's, there's a balance there. The other thing that we do, Kevin, is that we spend an enormous amount of time helping our tenants be successful. 
So we may have a tenant when we buy a property that we know is struggling, but has a really good business. We'll come in and as the landlord, we'll help them be successful. We'll help them with technology. We'll help them with energy efficiency. We'll help them with multiple things that will add value to them and their business. We're not in the business of just collecting rent and being a rent collecting landlord. We're in the business of helping our tenants. That helps them, helps the community. It helps us because they pay their rent and it helps us because they can pay more rent. So, Absolutely. It's a win-win yeah. all the way around. Right. Yeah. And it's funny because I think that there are landlords out there that kind of treat their tenants poorly in that fashion where it's like, okay, well, you have your business, uh, you run it, uh, you pay your rent, we're all good. Uh, that, that's not our approach. We, we take a very hands-on approach to our tenant base and, and trying to help them succeed. So at the end of the, I mean, at the end of the day, they probably spend, if a lot of these are mom and pop run businesses, they probably spend yeah. just as much time in that, in that business as they do their home under their roof. Right. And so it's no Absolutely. different than having a residential tenant and, and, and yeah. addressing their needs and, and being a good landlord and, uh, right. you know, just that's it, making, making it a comfortable experience for them to, to run their business out of. So, yeah, yeah, you know, that's absolutely right. And, you know, we've also found is that the mom and pop tenant and, you know, the regional credit tenant, uh, all, all of them, um, they may be really good at doing their business, but they're not necessarily good about promoting their business or making their business more successful. So if we can help them, for instance, develop their website, so they can attract more business so we can help them develop a customer loyalty program. Those are the types of things that, you know, as they say, sort of working on the business as opposed to just working in the business, Mm -hmm. we can help them work on their business to be more successful. And what we found is that we, we see great loyalty from our tenants as we embark upon that process. Once we buy a property. Mm -hmm. No, that, that's, that's amazing. Speaking from the other side of it, from a debt perspective, when you guys are doing, right. uh, you know, when you're acquiring a new property, what, what type of debt? And this is making the assumption that, you know, you'd mentioned, you know, kind of the average size maybe has uh, 10 storefronts. And so I'm guessing that's probably, what, 15 to 20,000 square foot center, give or take. Is that kind of the average size that we're speaking to here? Well, I mean, our typical shopping center is around 50,000 square feet. Okay. And it is typically a $5 million acquisition. So okay. again, you know, we're buying from an individual. It's $5 million bucks. I was going to try to figure out what the capital stack looks like. So a lot of things you guys are buying is value add. It might have some vacancy. So you guys are going to, you know, you might, you might be increasing rents over time. You might be, yeah. you know, filling in those vacant units. So you guys are going to ultimately, maybe it's from 5 million to six and a half million dollars over a period of 18, 24 yeah. months. What does that debt or that capital stack look like on the front side of the deal? And then ultimately, how do you guys extract that value that's been added over the first couple of years? Sure. So we keep it pretty simple here at Baseline, where we've never really been in the business of financial engineering things to make it complicated. And um, what we saw in the Great Recession, not only make it complicated, but over leveraging and over and just, you know, so many debt vehicles and so many real estate firms that participated in, you know, very esoteric debt strategies just failed. So we keep it pretty simple. We uh, use 60% leverage when we buy a property and 40% um, equity. We raise the equity. Uh, We have a a line of credit with a bank that we use to buy the property that provides a 60% leverage. So in any property that we buy, it's 60% debt, 40% equity. We model it so that as we're adding value, we're putting capital improvements in, however that works. We keep that leverage ratio about 60%. So in our view, Kevin, that that debt to equity ratio is uh, conservative. Mm -hmm. Um, Again, you know, we saw a lot of 80, 90, 95% leveraged real estate uh, acquisitions just, just, crumble during the recession. And um, we uh, we didn't have any of that. We didn't have any foreclosures because we've always used a very conservative mm-hmm. amount of leverage. And, and, you know, I mean, it all kind of hangs together using a technical term because we're uh, in the middle of the, co- in the middle of the country, we're in the middle of neighborhoods, we have everyday goods and service tenants. So, you know, we're not pushing things leverage wise, complexity wise, we're 
we keep it very consistent and that's allowed us to be successful over the last 20 years. Yeah, no, I, I, we, we subscribe to the same thing. I think our, our average leverage point across all of our, our portfolio is right around 64% or so. Sure. Yeah, yeah, just, and I, I've been through the downturn. In fact, it leads me to the next question since you brought it up. Right. Uh, it sounds like you didn't have any foreclosures. You didn't, you probably had some challenges, some struggles, right? I, I think everyone did, no matter how little leverage you might've had in place and how good of an operation. So how did the, you know, I guess uh, yeah. your portion of the retail sector, how did that fare? And I'm sure every market's a little different than the next of, of how they fared. Um, but right. overall, you know, uh, how did things look for you between yeah. 2008 and let's say 2011, 2012 era? Well, yeah, I, I, that's a great question. Uh, rolling into the recession into 2007, 2008, we, um, we had neighbors, shopping centers, uh, office buildings, and uh, some industrial flex properties uh, as as we work through the recession, the property type that held up the best was the neighborhood shopping center. And, mm. and then as we rolled out of the recession, we um, narrowed our focus just to be an owner and operator of neighborhood shopping centers. So the, the, the reason for it, at least from our um, perspective and what we saw is that um, our industrial properties in the office, really, the tenant base, it was easier for them to close up and go home. So, for instance, we had drywallers, electricians, and plumbers in our industrial properties. Well, those guys kind of rolled up shop, brought it to their garage, and then they stayed there and they pick up trucks. So, and they never really came back. Um, probably come back in a little bit now. So all those different types of properties, we saw the neighborhood shopping center held up the best. For the reason is that the people, if they get their haircut in good times and bad. They get a Subway sandwich in good times and bad. They go to the local, they go to the dry cleaner, they go to the local uh, sports bar and get a hamburger. So throughout the toughest of times, the businesses that we had in our properties they maintain their customer base. You know, maybe somebody got their haircut every six weeks instead of four, or something like that. But they still mm -hmm. got their haircut. You know, uh, women still got their nails done. And again, you know, they people still went to the dry cleaner. So, yeah, rolling through the recession, we saw the resilience of our tenant base, and then you know, basically turn that into it being the sole. Uh, purpose for our company moving forward as far as investing is, is concerned. We, we wanted to stick with that tenant base that has everyday goods and services. Mm -hmm. How did you manage, you know, like lease renewals during that challenging yeah. period of time? Obviously there was lots of other, you know, other folks had struggles in, in their shopping center. So vacancies might've opened up. You might've had a tenant that was looking to renew, you know, kind of tough to maybe throw in, you know, three or 4% annual increases over the next five or 10 years, whatever that lease right. term might be. But however, you also didn't want to, you don't want to kind of, you know, shoot yourself in the foot by not putting them in at some point or having the ability to recapture it once the market turns right. around. So how do you manage situations like yeah, that? Yeah, you know, well, so we took a real hands-on view with each tenant. And one of the things that we saw because of the types of properties that we own, um, you know, we, we have always owned what I would say class B type of neighborhood shopping centers. So our rents are lower than what you would see in regional malls or class A power centers and mm -hmm. stuff like that. So if our average rental rate was $12 a square foot per year, we might have to make a concession down to 11 or 1050 for a couple of years. And we would always talk to our tenants, okay, well, we'll, put, we'll bring you down to 11 for the next two years, but then we're gonna bump you back up and try to recoup that in years four and five of your lease or seven, eight, nine, 10 and we release something like that. But I guess my point being is that our rents at 12 bucks a foot, if we had to go down to 11, that was doable. If our rents were at $30 a square foot or 60 bucks a square foot and you had to go to 15 or 30, you know, th those are pretty big changes in your, uh, in the income coming from a particular sure. tenant. So the word isn't muted, but it was definitely, definitely kind of, Tempered because our lease rates have always been lower than really expensive lease rates. So, you know, in the tough times, we just had to cut a little bit less, I think. And 
and we were able to kind of smooth through the recession. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Fantastic. So I love to speak from like a, uh, from a SWOT analysis perspective, you know, strengths, weaknesses, opportunities, threats. What do you perceive to be, you know, some of the, I guess the, the biggest weaknesses or threats against the retail sector. Uh, you know, everyone speaks about e-commerce and Amazon right. and, you know, that it is changing the world. But however, people still will go to the neighborhood shopping center. People still need to get haircuts. They still need to get their dry cleaning until, until Amazon can figure that one out, which they might. Right. Who knows? But what are some of the other big threats that exist in this space? Um, I'm glad you mentioned e-commerce because it's something that we think about all the time. Mm-hmm. And uh, as we're looking at putting new tenants into our shopping centers, we're looking at whether their uh, sales are e-commerce resistant. And Kevin, you, you just mentioned it, you know, Amazon still can't cut your hair. Amazon's not yet, at least. They, at might have, they, they might have drones with clippers on them at some point. Right. Yes, yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> um, yeah. Uh, they may, they may. But, you know, not only was our tenant base uh, recession resistant, but now it's e-commerce resistant and and we're continually working on that. So Mm -hmm. I would say, and and you mentioned this, we we kind of have that covered, right? I mean, we understand how e-commerce is affecting the world. We understand that we're we're always moving our uh, focus into new uses that are internet sales resistant. But, you know, there are other things that we have to keep our eyes on. We have to keep our eyes on, I mean, like other, say, crazy stuff that we hear about all the time is, you know, well, how would autonomous driving vehicles affect our shopping centers? Well, we have big parking lots. And if there are less cars in those parking lots, you know, how do we use that space more effectively? And there might be an opportunity, right? Because if we need five parking spaces per 1,000 square feet, which is kind of an industry average, uh, we might need you know three parking spaces per 1,000 feet. So that means that we could put an extra pad out in the parking lot and put an extra business there. So, you know. Yeah, that's more of a value add opportunity there when you speak to the autonomous vehicles and having that parking density actually decrease. There's actually a question I wanted to ask when we were talking about different value add opportunities within uh, your sector. And have you seen, has there been any changes in, you know, generally speaking, you know, parking lot density requirements decreasing? You know, for example, you know, quite often, in fact, there's, you know, a pretty large redevelopment happening on an old Kmart yeah. center, which, you know, back in the day when they built those things, yeah. um, you know, the parking lots were massive, right? right. They were set deep back, you know, into the, into the space. And then you got this massive parking lot, you know, in fact, I just, it's happening in a Kmart uh, that they're redeveloping into a bunch of different retail storefronts. They've put a couple of different out parcels there. There's another kind of a power center uh, near where uh, our office is based that, I had like Staples, had Barnes and Nobles, had Old Navy and a bunch of others. And uh, that really hasn't changed. That's not that old of a center. However, they did just recently put, I'm guessing probably about an eight to 10,000 square foot retail out parcel there over the last year or two, in addition to like a fast food parcel that didn't sure. exist exist prior. So has that, has that been a, an ongoing change as far as like a parking lot density requirements are concerned? Yeah, absolutely. And I mean, I would even take it one step further is that what we're seeing is that there are some boxes that are just never going to be filled with traditional retail anymore. Mm-hmm. So what we're starting to see, and whether it's a Kmart redevelopment or a regional mall redevelopment, is that if it's good real estate, if it's located well, then there are other uses for that real estate. So I was just um, out of town and I stayed across the street from a, from a uh, place that used to be a, a big um, outlet. It was an outlet mall. So mm-hmm. uh, let's say they had 60 different outlets. Well, half of those outlets are gone now. So what they've done is that they've shrunk the retail portion of the shopping center they built a hotel and, and a self storage in the other where the other half of the shopping center was. So the developer got to give them a lot of credit. They took a failing, too big, you know, too durable goods oriented, too internet sales susceptible outlet mall, and now have redeveloped it into different types of commercial real estate that will work into the future. So 
Yeah, absolutely. I, and, and, you know, this will continue as, you know, we see some of the big change closing more and more locations. There aren't a lot of uh, new retailers coming into those spaces to coming into those big box type of spaces. So we're going to see a lot of redevelopment. And again, if it's good real estate, it gets redeveloped. If it's not so good real estate, it's going to be tougher to deal with. But mm-hmm. um, it, things are changing rapidly, clearly, uh, yeah. within the traditional retail space. Yeah, fantastic. Uh, speaking from a property management perspective, uh, you guys have got you know locations in, in many different markets in different states across the country. Yeah. How do you manage the you know the, the leasing? I know that you have your own property management infrastructure, but how do you manage the boots on the ground? You know, I don't know what the concentration looks like in these different markets. So maybe you have substantial you know hundreds of thousands, millions of square feet in one given market where you can justify having you know uh, a dedicated leasing individual in each one of these respective markets. So I guess maybe speak to that a little bit of how that infrastructure looks on your side. Yeah. What we found is that we utilize a uh, combination of um, internal leasing capabilities and um, external, meaning that on all of our properties, we have a um, a traditional third-party brokerage firm Mm -hmm. that is helping us with our leasing. You know, those folks know the local markets, know the local leasing markets better than we do. So we're going to take advantage of hiring uh, whoever it is, a CBRE or whatever firm that's out there to help us lease up our properties. But with that being said, we also have a very robust internal leasing management group that not only manages those external brokers, but um, actively uh, renews our our current tenants. So we know our current tenants best, we know what they can pay, we know what the market is, all that type of stuff. So we're always in the business of renewing our current tenant base and Mm -hmm. and working with the outside broker to, uh, to bring new tenants to our property. And we just found that that combination, you know, that local expertise with the mm-hmm. the external broker and then our internal expertise with the tenants in our property works well. Yeah, no, that, that makes a ton of sense, uh, uh, especially when you're spread out amongst multiple different yeah. you know, markets. So that makes it. Well, I, yeah, you know, Kevin, another thing is that we, uh, I mean, we love the brokerage community because not only do they help us with the properties that we own, but they help us find new Five deals That's buy it. or sell properties that we want to sell, right? So. I mean, our business is uh, controlled so much by the by the you know by the brokerage community that you know we 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 embrace everybody and, mm-hmm. and use that to really operate on all facets of our business. Would you say that's a majority of where your new acquisition leads come from? Is the yes. brokerage community okay? Yeah, um, most of our new acquisition leads come from the brokerage community uh, and. That that has really never changed, and and it won't for a long time. I mean, there's new iterations of the brokerage world. So we have mm-hmm. you know, the online brokerage houses now. We've got traditional brokerage houses. Um, what we've also done, again, because we have some scale, is that we've created a database of over ten thousand individual owners that are not represented by mm-hmm. brokers, and we cold call. You know, uh, yeah. we call, call and say, uh, hey, Mary, do you want to sell your shopping center? Uh, the answer is usually no, but you know, if it's no, but I'll keep you in mind, that's great. So we've had success in buying directly from a seller. Yeah. And we think we have the most robust database of uh, neighborhood shopping centers. Uh, nobody else has spent the time or the effort to put together a uh, a database of potential sellers. So we're getting more and more traction there. Yeah. I was going to ask you, proportionally speaking, what do you think percentage of deals have you purchased, you know, from brokerages as opposed to direct from owners? Oh, it's 95% brokerage. Okay. 5% okay. owners. So, got it. Got it. Yeah. 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 Well, our, our business is, you know, we're, we're in a different niche. We own manufactured housing communities across the country, but we, uh, we kind of took the opposite approach. We do buy through brokers. However, we put a lot of emphasis about five years ago into building a nationwide database that yeah. you, you can't just go buy. And uh, we spent a lot of time cultivating right. those relationships. And uh, so actually about 90% of what we own uh, has come directly uh-huh. from owners uh, opposed to about 10% from brokers. Uh, but we do we maintain those broker relationships and they're vital. I mean, they're vital right. to, to surviving in any 
particular niche that you might be in. So, absolutely, uh, yeah. yeah, absolutely, that's right. So, so I'd love to know, being that you've been at this now for for many many years, the commercial real estate game, you guys have made iterations along the way, have uh, you know changed course when times got a little tough, had you know kind of honed in on focusing just on the retail sector and got rid of that you know the flex space and the office space. But after all all that was said and done, you know where you're at today, if you can go back in time. And give yourself some advice when you're first getting started. What advice would that be? Well, that's a good question. <laughs> I think that the advice would be that hitting just a bunch of singles and doubles over a long period of time is the way to go. And, you know, we have been distracted along the way, much less so in the past uh, six or seven years than in the previous. 10 years or so uh, with kind of chasing some stuff that um, looked pretty shiny, but, you know, may or may not have worked all that well, where, and if I were to say 20 years ago to me and my partners would be like, Hey, you know, yeah, let's just stick with hitting a bunch of doubles because hitting a bunch of doubles is, is pretty good. Hitting a bunch of singles and doubles and, you know, not, not pressing it too much. So, you know, we got through the whole mess the Great Recession pretty well and are here today thriving. But yeah, I mean, that, that would be, it's just like pick a niche and stick with it. And if it works, just kind of, you know, stick yeah. with it over a long period of time. Yeah. I was going to ask you, what, what is the long-term game plan of, of baseline investments? When you guys go in to purchase a property, is it, you know, with the, you know, with the intent of having a 10 year hold, 20 year hold, I mean, really what's the long-term game for you guys? Sure, sure. Uh, we'll typically underwrite a five-year hold on a property. Mm-hmm. So we're, we have traditionally been buying and operating and selling all times. Um, today, we're acquiring more than we're selling, and mm-hmm. we're, we're adding size to our portfolio, Kevin. So at some point in the future, you know, we can see going public, we can see uh, teaming up with uh, more institutional partner to grow even even further but at this point where we sit today we're building our portfolio to have one of those options in the in the future and yeah. clearly going public is an option um, uh, having a large private equity strategic partner in the future mm-hmm. is an option you know, and that, that's where our focus is on today. It's, it's growing right. the company and, uh, and adding scale. Got it. Got it. Well, this has been fantastic, David. L- lots of great information uh, that you shared here today yeah. with us. And, you know, I'd like to enter what I like to call the golden nugget segment of the show. Now, this is kind of where we're going to wrap things up and sure. shared a ton of gold nuggets already. But if you had just one final gold nugget of advice or wisdom that you could leave with the listeners today that might inspire and motivate them as they progress in their very own real estate investing career. What would that one last gold nugget be? I mean, I think the last golden nugget would be to, uh, you know, is to be a risk taker and go out there and, uh, and, you know, buy some real estate, but do it prudently. Right. Which goes back to that hitting singles and doubles type of thing, because Mm -hmm. no matter what anybody says about prices being overheated the market being, you know, too competitive, there's opportunity. And as maybe an individual investor, family investor, whatever it is, you can find opportunity. And, you know, taking a low risk and buying that property, whatever it is, and fixing it up and and adding value to your earlier point, um, that's a tried and true formula that, that sticks it really at any time. And, yeah. you know, the, I hear so much, well, the market's too overheated, it's too expensive, blah, blah, blah. Well, yeah, generally it is, but, you know, there's opportunity out there sure. that all of us can continue to find it. You just got to dig a little deeper. That's right. all. That's what I say. You know, we, we, we had a phenomenal year last year and this yeah. year we've, uh, it, it's been much, much lower. We've, we've killed more deals than we purchased, uh, but it, sure. you just got to dig deeper. That's it. I mean, there's right. more folks out there chasing yield, more people looking to, to jump ship from one asset to the next. Uh, yeah. you know, what, what we're seeing is a big migration from those that are, or were in the multifamily space or coming over to our space. They would have probably yeah. turned their nose up at it three years ago. And so right. there's a little bit more competition. And again, just got to, you know, claw a little deeper into the, uh, Oh yeah. And your space dirt. is similar to ours. I mean, it's, it's relatively undiscovered if there's a great opportunity ahead mm-hmm. and, and that's meaningful for us. So sure. I, uh, I agree with you. 
Yeah. Well, Dave, this has been an absolute pleasure having you here. And folks, if you want to learn more about David and, and his group, you can go visit his website. It's baselineinvestments.com. That's baseline, B-A-C-E, lineinvestments.com. And David, just want to thank you for coming on the show here today. And uh, uh, yeah, I want to thank each and every one of you that, that tuned in uh, for this week's show for, for being here. And until we meet again next week, guys, this is your host, Kevin Bupp, wishing you huge success. Congratulations. Now you've got more of the best tricks of the trade in building massive amounts of passive income from real estate. For more amazing resources, visit realestateinvestingforcashflow.com and we'll see you next Monday morning.